and welcome to the Prigya Arora show where we discuss law and entrepreneurship with people who have been there and done that. My name is Prigya Arora, founder of PA Legal and Intellectual Property Law Firm in India and our guest for today is a disruptor and managing director of Big Yellow Peg Penguin, Mr. Sean Jardine. Welcome Sean on the show. Hello, Pragera, and th many thanks for inviting me on. I'm looking forward to it. Great, Sean. So let us begin with our warm-up question, which is, what is one thing in life that you can't live without? Um, I'm a great uh, fan of a, a, a spread called Marmite, and I don't know if you have that where you live, but Marmite is a yeast-based extract. It's a bit like Vegemite, if anybody's ever heard of that. And I, I eat a lot of Marmite and my wife buys me Marmite based products. So for this Easter, she's actually already bought me some Marmite and cheese hot cross buns. So, um, yeah, Marmite is one of the things I'm slightly addicted to. So if ever people want to make uh, you happy, people have to gift you, give you, gift you a lot of Marmite so that you can enjoy it. Uh, yeast based <laughs> product. Yeah, that'll, be, <laughs> that'll, that'll do me. But people either love it or they hate it. And, um, but I love it. Awesome. So, Sean, can you share your story and how did you become the person you are today? Oh, gosh. OK. Um, so in, 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 in 1980, a long time before you were born, I suspect, um, I, I went to university, did my law degree. Uh, when I turned up at university, because at that time there were only three places in England you could do your solicitor's final exams and only three. I think three or four places you could do your barrister's final exams. I was told by my tutor in the first term of my first year, you now have to decide if you want to be a solicitor or a barrister. I went, wow, you know, I, 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 I know nothing about the law. I've literally just got here wet behind the ears. And, and they said, if you don't apply now, you won't get a place in three years time. And so I did what every good self-respecting lawyer sh should do when faced with these dilemmas. I actually got a coin out of my pocket. I flipped it up. <laughs> oh. Heads, solicitor, tails, barrister. Oh, it's heads. I'm going to become a solicitor. So I made my application form to go to law school. And then three years later, that's where I ended up. Uh, it was a lot easier then to get training contracts than it is now. And the, uh, again, that was because the supply of people coming onto the job markets was limited with only three law schools. Um, so I, I, I was in a fortunate position of having a choice of firms that wanted me to go and work for them. Um, so I did my, it was called articles then, training contracts now, uh, trained as a lawyer, ended up working for a couple of uh, large regional firms in Surrey, in England, and then I met a guy at one firm where we became partners, and we decided to leave that firm and set up our own business. And so we left uh, Surrey, uh, moved to Oxfordshire. We set up a business that was merged with another practice about after about five years. And then I stayed at that firm, became head of the litigation department, eventually became the chief executive uh, uh then commercial director and then uh last year when i was 60 years of age i know i don't look it i look so much younger or older to it is appropriate um I, I i retired from private practice and then set up uh, the business the big yellow penguin awesome sean and you are the youngest one on the show youngest guest of mine <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think you need to get down that optician's a bit a bit sharpish if you think that. But bless you. Thank you, Sean. And Sean, uh, can you tell us like how did you come up with the name Big Yellow Penguin? What is the idea behind it? How ah, you started well, it? What are your aims? Ah, <laughs> uh, well, um, a number of number of considerations, and they're all linked. The first thing is I'm a great fan of change management. And when my daughter went to university, the deal was dad would buy the books. So she would send her book, buy her books, they'd be sent home. And one book that got sent home was this. And it's called Our Iceberg is Melting. And it's a business fable by a Harvard Business School guru called John Cotter. And I suggest all your viewers follow John Cotter. Um, and it was 
this was a book about a group of penguins who are on an iceberg and if they couldn't find a new home they were going to die now at the time we were going through a big change management project so i bought loads of copies of this book and i gave it to my partners and said look this is going to be the methodology that we adopt on our change management program so we had something we had to do internally and we were adopting cotter's eight steps of change management and then i was invited to talk at a law conference um, about about the project we've under undergone and about change in the profession generally. And so I decided I would go dressed as a penguin. So I went onto Amazon, I bought myself a penguin costume um, and I stood up at this conference in Birmingham dressed as a penguin. I later then went to London and also in Dallas in Texas. So I've addressed conferences dressed as a penguin. So that when it came to starting my own consultancy, because I'm a fan of change and I'm an advocate of change, and that is a great change management book, I thought it would be appropriate to call myself the big yellow penguin. Why a yellow penguin, you might think? Well, the answer to that is yellow penguins do exist, but they're very rare. And so I thought that would be a great name for my business. And um, as you can see in the background there, you've got Declan, the uh, inflatable penguin. Uh, as I Dec Declan and I will go to conferences, speak at conferences. He, he, uh, to be fair, he doesn't say very much, but um, that's how the business came about and that's how we've called it what we've called it. Awesome, Sean. And I know every photo of yours has this penguin and we adore it so much. It's so I think it's so lovable, it's warm that people want to just interact with you. <laughs> <laughs> I think Declan, Declan gets more messages than I do, you know, but uh, yeah, he seems, he, people seem to like him, but that, that, that's good. <laughs> yeah, great. So uh, you speak about value pricing a lot and we have been following you in terms of value pricing, how it works like. So can you tell us what it means to the people who do not know and how uh, they should incorporate more of value pricing? Oh, wow. OK, great question. OK, let's just think value pricing. All value pricing is, is getting a price that is fair for the services that you do, be a lawyer, accountant, whatever it is, but getting capturing some of that value that you give to your clients and actually keeping it, keep that value. What you don't do is bill by the hour. I hate the billable hour. I think that clients hate billable hours. They don't get it. They just understand if you're going to bill by the hour, you've got a vested interest in doing a really slow job. Good. The slowest horse will win the race in the billable hour. Um, interestingly, today of all days, there's an article in the, uh, in the England and Wales Law Society Gazette where the Court of Appeal has said to an American firm, you cannot get £1,000 an hour for the work that they've done. I had that's 16 pounds a minute. And so clients don't perceive value in terms of hourly rates and relationships with clients are not built on looking at a clock. They really are. So value pricing is where you will actually talk to your client first, have a conversation, find out what their pain points are. And I'm afraid buying legal services is always a pain point. You are, when you're buying legal services, it's either because you are in pain in a certain way or you are aspirational in so far as you want to buy a business, you want to buy your dream house or something like that. And to find out what value is, you have to have a, you have to have a conversation with your customer. It's as simple as that. Okay. And some lawyers don't like having conversations. Some lawyers' websites will have automatic calculators to calculate a price, even so that I don't even have to speak to the customer. Really? And, and that is just madness. So value pricing, it's had that conversation. It's not a number when you talk about value pricing. It will turn into a number that you want to charge for your work. But if you think about value, value is always a feeling. You, you know that you, you'll feel, I've got somewhere, it's a bargain. And you might go somewhere and think, oh, actually, no, I, I paid that amount of money. I don't feel I did get value there. That's a feeling in, in, in your gut, in your heart. Okay. Um, and really, 
when you come down to, to value, there's, it's not rational. Why do people queue up at midnight to buy the latest iPhone? Why do they do Because they want to be the first to have it because it makes them feel good. Got it. I, would, I wouldn't do that. Why do people like to drive different types of car? I've got, I, I, I'm not into cars. My wife is into cars. I, all I want my car to do is start and get me to where I want to go. I, I really don't care what state it's in as long as it gets me there. A friend of mine has got a very expensive car. Makes him feel good. But they both do the same things. They get you from A to B. Yeah. I would say mine is more comfortable than his, but he's got a very high performance sports car. So um, that's really when you get into value. That I, I, I could talk for hours literally on this <laughs> subject and, and I do courses on it. But yeah, it's it's when you get into value pricing, please read about it. There's lots of information about there. Follow my website if you want to or follow me on LinkedIn or whatever. But there's lots of materials that will encourage you and those viewing this to get off the billable hour because it's time has come. I think Sean very rightly said, and that's why we all admire you. Because if we see it from the perspective of a client, client would like to know how much he's going to spend on a case. And if if that is valuable to him, then he'll spend. Otherwise, he'll think, oh my God, every for every month I have to spend this amount of money. I can't hire a lawyer. And we as a as a prof as professionals in this field, we have a duty to help clients. They need handholding, they need literacy whenever they come to us. So I think first conversation is very, very important to them. And that, that first conversation, you've hit the nail on the head. That first conversation, you can ask anything. Correct. You know, you can you can ask these questions. When a client comes to you in the first conversation, they've got four options. Their, their options are do nothing, do it themselves, retain you, yeah. or retain a competitor. Now, the fact they've picked up the phone and they're speaking to you or they come to your office is that they've discounted the first two. They don't want to do nothing and they don't want to do it themselves. So then their choice is who they're going to buy from, you or your competitor. And also you need to get over the fact that, you know, lots of people say, oh, there's, there's a market rate for this job, really. I've never found this market. <laughs> I've never, I, if anyone ever says that to you, say, where is this market? Take me there. Show me the material that this market produces. And it's not. It's a gut feel. It's People will say, I'm just frightened to price high. Yeah. So I'll price low because that makes me, as the lawyer, feel better. But you're leaving value on the table. Correct. Absolutely. It's so important for the clients also to judge because, yeah, as I told you, like for, for me also, some clients will come and they'll say, okay, you're... Uh, we know a firm that is doing this in this price. So I, I'll say, okay, you can go ahead and get your work done through them, but you'll be losing the value which I can provide. And I, I think it's absolutely important in terms of us as lawyers as well that we should value whatever we are providing to the clients. Absolutely. And, and low self-esteem is a problem with lawyers. And whilst we will fight like tigers for our clients of their case, mm -hmm. sometimes when it talks, when we're talking about getting the value that we bring, we're not that bullish. We're not that forceful. And that's what we really do need to get into that conversation. And if the client doesn't understand the value, that's the lawyer's fault because mm -hmm. we haven't made it clear. And that's where we've got to make that clear in in, in value pricing. Good. You know, if you if you think about value is contextual, okay? If you think about having a glass of water, if you want to go and have a glass of water now, you're going to wander down to your kitchen, turn a tap, brilliant glass of water, thank you very much. And you're thinking, I'm in my home and my office, I'm not going to pay for that, I'm just going to go and get it. It's going to cost me nothing. If, if let's pretend we're in, in a family in the car with the kids are screaming in the background and we're on a journey and the kids are the kids are thirsty. Oh, they're crying out. I need a drink. I need a drink. Now there's a price that we will pay at the garage to when we pull over to buy a bottle of water, uh, and you know we, we're going to pay a bit more for that. If, however, we're then on holiday somewhere and we're going on a hike and we've forgotten the water. And someone says, well, I've got two litres of bottled water here. You can take this on your hand. How much are you going to pay for that? Because that, if you don't buy it off me, you've got a debt. You're losing a day. I'm going to pay more for that 
water okay. then. Absolutely. And then if it's the last bottle of water as you're crawling through the desert, coming out the other side, and you're thinking, oh, I'm, I'm, you know, if I don't have that drink, I'm going to, how much are you going to pay? And the answer is more than that. So it's contextual, it varies. Okay. And the lawyer's job is to find out at what level of pain the client is in because then you price your service accordingly. And it's as, it is as simple as that, you know, okay. and no, no one should price their own work. If you think about footballers have agents, literary book, people who write books have agents, barristers in the UK have clerks that negotiate their fee. And why do they incur all these overheads? Why do they give away these percentages? And the answer is because those people are better at negotiating the rates. Okay. Simple as that. So, you know, other, other industries do it. <laughs> Law can do it, and we should. Absolutely. I, and uh, I think it all boils down to the first conversation that we have with the client and the negotiator, whoever the negotiator is. So it is absolutely important to judge how much work is required, what value am I providing, what value the client requires, and then reach to an appropriate point. Absolutely. And if you think about it, pricing is something you do before you do the work. Billing is something you do once you've done the work. Now, yeah. once you've done the work, if you find out once you've done it, your client doesn't want to pay, you're left with either discounting or billing or an unhappy client. You may as well find out at the beginning Got that it. your client doesn't want to pay the amount because then you haven't done the work. That's fine. If somebody doesn't, if, you, if you've got a job that you think, yeah, the, the right price for this job is a thousand pounds, fine. If a client is in their mind that I've got, I only want to pay ten pounds. Well, you can't, sorry, you're not the right firm. You're sorry, you're not the right client for us. You're not a good fit. Very. Good luck. Go elsewhere. But you haven't actually done the work. All you've had is a conversation. And again, law firms are very bad at sacking clients. Yeah. Bad clients <laughs> drive out good clients. Okay. <laughs> Lawyers should be prepared to sack clients. And bear in mind that you do not need to do every bit of work. You need to do more than your fair share of the good stuff. Okay. So get rid of the dross. If it's, if it's not good, it's not profitable. If the clients are not nice people to deal with, don't deal with them. Let them take their toxic cases and their attitudes and their dysfunctional way that they put together cases and, you know, I could think of clients who've turned up with shoe boxes full of documents and you think, oh, I'm going to spend hours just putting this into order. Um, I don't want I don't want to act for those people unless they're prepared to pay the premium for me short sorting out shoe boxes. But you need to say goodbye to people. Uh, uh, client fit is important. Perfect. So, uh, Sean, uh, just one question. I know it, it could be an offbeat question, but do you think expertise fall in place with value pricing? The more expertise we have, the more value we can generate for the client and uh, charge premium probably. Absolutely. Absolutely. That is one of the real drivers because why is a client coming to an expert? Because you want peace of mind to think this person really knows what they're doing. Um my wife recently had an eye operation and she went, she went to this specialist and said, oh, I don't really do this eye operation. I can recommend you to the person who is really good at these going into the eye, cutting away her muscles and tightening them. Okay, okay. That's what she had to do. We, when she went to see this guy, our private health would only pay X and he wanted more than X. And he stuck to his price. And guess what? We paid it. Because my wife was not prepared to go to the either guy who was not the expert to think, yeah. well, we'll give you a go. You're going to save us. You're going to save us about 800 pounds, but we'll give you a go. No, we'll go to the expert. And, and if you are an expert in your field or you have a niche expertise, you can always charge more for that. And that's why people should look at niches, because yeah. if you're a general practitioner and you do everything, that's okay. That's a business model, but it's harder to charge a premium price to say, I am the person that you need to come to to get that work done. 
Absolutely. I think this is so, and it resonates with me so much because I am into IP and I tell everybody that I do IP only and I am an expert of IP. So I don't enter into property law, family law and things like that. And because of that, I think uh, I am at a good place. <laughs> so I resonate with this so much, this conversation, and it's so helpful for, I think, everyone who is listening to this. Oh, good. Well, well, you, the sign behind your head there says it all. You, well, it's always you've got to believe you're worth it and the innovation that you provide. And what's between your ears in terms of your brain power is what creates value for your for your clients. Yeah, awesome. And Sean, uh, now coming back to you and uh, your life, you call yourself a disruptor and you have been a disruptor. Can you tell us something about how you uh, ended up to be a disruptor and why do you call yourself as one? <laughs> um, well, again, probably going back to my early days as a, a young solicitor, I went, to, uh, I went to a meeting at the Law Society, Chancery Lane in London. So you go through this to the hallowed arches of the doors to the Law <laughs> Society. And I went to a meeting there and I was probably about two or three years qualified at the time. And they had this person going on about law and had the services, et cetera. And I, they said, anybody got any questions? And I put my hand up and I said, look, I think legal services are no more than being similar to pizza delivery. And you see these people, what? I said, look, what our clients want is a product as they've ordered, as they've described at a price agreed and delivered on time, because the only time the clients care about is turnaround time, no other kind of time. Anyway, an old guy sitting next to me nearly had a heart attack. He, he said, I have never heard such nonsense. And how, you, how do you bring disrepute upon our noble profession? I thought, oh dear, I, I think I'm in the, I, I think I'm you know, upsetting a few people here. Anyway, I've always, um, been, I think I've always been the way I am. And I think when if anyone will ever say to you in your career, you don't seem like a normal lawyer, that is because their perception of normal lawyers is usually bad. Okay. Yeah, and you and, and and all of a sudden, you know, so people say, God, you don't seem like a normal lawyer. Well, what are they expecting? Uh, pinstripes, dust, cluttered offices. You know, that I, I'm going to put the clock on as soon as they walk in the door and I'm going to charge them shed loads of money even to have a conversation with them to say, I'm afraid you haven't got a case. You know, I used to say when I was taking appointments, there, there, there's a charitable magazine called The Big Issue that homeless people will sell. And I would say to people, well, they come in, if they have some initial advice and they didn't have a case, I would just say, look, go and buy two or three copies of The Big Issue. And we'll call it quits, you know, uh, uh, and because to open a file, to raise a bill, a small bill for amount of money that added no value. Well, the client, I suppose, got some value where we were told they hadn't got a case, but it was much better to say, go and spend some money with the local charity. Okay. We'll call it quits then. And that that will be fine. And. You know, if you if you are going to be a, a disruptor, somebody called me the other week, called me an iconoclast, you know, a breaker of icons. Yeah. And so I started a group on LinkedIn called Legal Iconoclast. And I know that you're a member. Thank you for joining recently. Um, there are some amazing people in that group. Definitely. All over the world doing some very, very interesting things. So if any of your viewers want to join Legal Iconoclast, just go to it on LinkedIn, have a look and join. And there's some great stuff being done out there and the business model has got to change. The hourly rate is dead. Let's talk to clients about value. Let's talk about delivering a service, you know, uh, I, and that's why I think I, I call myself a disruptor. And I've got to the stage where, you know, I, I, I'm not in private practice anymore. I, I can be even more disruptive now because people can't do anything about it. The yes. Citizens Regulation Authority can't come in and slap me, <laughs> slap me down. You know? I, 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 I could do this stuff all the time now, and I'm not doing client work that is regulated by the SRA. So, um, and I'm, I, and I, I could call it as I see it, and I'm quite enjoying that. 
great chan and uh, you know i think i envy you because i am regulated by everything <laughs> and i can't try a number of businesses and other things that i want to <laughs> So maybe in future I am also one of you who just <laughs> comes out of this loop and do something different. <laughs> well, the good thing I would encourage everybody have an inquisitive mind, always, and and seek to challenge people where mm-hmm. you can because the 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 industry won't change. You know, lawyers are risk averse, naturally conservative. They believe that change should happen to everybody but them. And, 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 you know, that's part of the battle of being a lawyer. So it, we've got to make sure that we influence the profession. And there's one other book I'll raise at you, and it's another John Cotter book. And this one is about meerkats, okay? And it's change management by meerkats, but it's the, how the junior meerkats influenced the board, the senior meerkats, the alpha meerkats in the group. So it's another fable. It's still based on change management, but it is how people, if you look further down the food chain in organizations, big organizations, can influence up. And that is a really good book. John wrote this, uh, I think it was a couple of years ago, but that's a really good read as well. So um, get, get, get that from your local bookstore. Awesome. So we will just share these books on our channel as well so that everybody can benefit from it. And it's so interesting to know different perspectives from different parts of the world. Still, we are all the same and we are in the same boat, experimenting things and making something happen. Yeah, great stuff. Uh, so, uh, Sean, now coming to again to your life, like like you changed, switched your career at a later part of your life. I know you are very young, you, as you just told us, but still, uh, can you advise? Because I know people uh, around later part of their life, they, they have this fear that how they'll start again or how they'll change their careers. So can you share some advice with people who are fearful in starting or anything that you want to, because you have gone through that journey. So I, I think you are the best person who can share this advice. Oh, a tough question. Okay. Um, I think you've got to believe in yourself I think you've got to have a good proposition I think you've got to believe in yourself I think you've got to do your homework uh, um, you've got to exploit your network I'm a I, I'm a great fan of networking always have been from my very earliest days um, um, and network it's in its name it is work it is not you go and net sit it is okay. not you go and net eat it is you go and network and you and the fact is, if you, if you went to a networking event, if you walked in and said, hi, who wants to buy IP services? <laughs> no one is going to run over to you and say, oh, okay. no, that is just the person I've been looking for. But if you can help people in your network, then all of a sudden when people later on will say, oh, I know who you should speak to. I met someone at an event recently. I'll give you a ring or I'll introduce you. And that's how it works. And interesting enough, yesterday I had an email from somebody who tracked me down. He said, Sean, 20 years ago, you helped my brother, who was a drummer in a rock band, uh, and it was a, a dispute over some royalties. And I thought, gosh, yeah, I, I vaguely remember that. I, I do vaguely remember something about it. I couldn't name the band. Um, and he said, anyway, I've got myself into a bit of a pickle can you can I and I know you're not a practicing solicitor anymore can you recommend someone that I should go to now that is 20 years off so yeah. invest in your network now because this is you never know where these things are going to lead to invest in your personal brand I think you're doing exactly the right things for your career look at you you've got your own channel brilliant stuff you're you're interviewing people you're learning you're continuing to learn and every day is a school day I you know I'm still reading books you know and and I encourage everybody to do that um and then you know just stick with it if you've got a good value proposition if there's a demand for what you're doing and if you have a reputation for doing it well, then hopefully whatever this new career might be, 
um, it, you should be fine. Correct. Absolutely. Uh, John, Sean, sorry. Uh, you know, you just said something very beautiful about networking that network is net plus work. So when I started my journey, I, I used to draft patent applications and do IP related written work. And networking for me, I, I used to consider that that is not work. Work is writing, work is advising clients, work is not network. But eventually after two years of setting up of setting up my own firm, I realized that network is so important. Relationships are so important. Like if you have right relationships, people are there to support you. And if you help someone, like you said, people can come back after 20 years. Okay. So keep yeah. helping people and you don't know when that uh, your help will come back to you again. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and that's why, you know, it, and, and that's one of the joys of you know, I, I think being a lawyer as well, you do you do get to help people, um, and, and you will be helping clients on a daily basis. And one of those one question you can always ask every client at the conclusion of a matter is, do you know anyone else? Do you know anyone else who I could help? Yeah. Because when they're thanking you for your service because you've done such a great job, the tears of joy are rolling down their face. Okay. Do you know anyone else who might benefit from my service? I'd really appreciate if you could make that introduction. Yeah. They make that introduction. Great. Hello, this is me. You might not have a need for me now, but this is where I am when you need me. And, you know, look, LinkedIn and the Internet didn't even exist at the beginning of my career. But now you've got it as a great tool and you've got it for all of your career. So start working it. Thanks, Sean. I think I, uh, I don't know who all will take this advice, but I promise you that I am going to do it from tomorrow. Every client who thanks me, I'm like, please introduce me to someone else too. <laughs> well, when you go when you go out, I will always take out <laughs> a, a number of business cards. I always take out a number, even if I'm going to a meeting with one client. I'll take three or four, so I'll give them two cards. I say it's one for you and one for someone you might know. Awesome. That, that's so good. <laughs> Great. Like I, I personally, the reason I do this podcast is because I personally get to learn so much from the best of people in the world. So I think I should be thankful to God and to everybody that I was able to start this. Well, you, you're doing a great job and looking down the list of some of the people who you've interviewed. Yeah, I see that you were speaking with Scott Simmons not so long ago and uh, Scott's a friend of mine. And I, I thought, blimey, OK, I'll have to make sure that I, I do a good job because if Scott's going to know I'm here, you know, I, I better be make sure that I look and sound good for it. So. <laughs> Awesome. When we get to learn, I think uh, Scott is also too young, so we get to learn so much <laughs> from you. <laughs> So, uh, Sean, coming to our rapid fire round very quickly and answer these very quickly. So three things you are grateful for. Uh, my family every day, uh, golf courses, because I like playing golf. And I like playing golf all around the world. So I love golf courses and fly fishing because oh. I quite like fly fishing. And, you know, I, nothing more exciting than catch, catching a fish on a fly rod. So I, that's what I'm thankful for. Awesome. And two traits that you think are useful for a legal career? Um, I'll give you three. Empathy. You've got to empathize with the pain that your clients are experiencing. Tenacity, because you've got to keep at it. And a sense of humor, because you will need this in your career. I think very important and very underrated. I haven't heard from any lawyer that you require a sense of humor. But <laughs> if you have, you have an advantage. <laughs> <laughs> and one aspiration you have for the future. Oh, I got, I, I'll give you two. Sorry, I'm going to be greedy. I want to reduce my golf handicap to get that down. And I'd like to do a bit more traveling. So, the, the you know, COVID, the pandemic, I'm sure is limited our travel aspirations yeah but there's a bit more of the world i'd quite like to see awesome and uh, sean to conclude can you give some key takeaways for young lawyers and legal entrepreneurs okay read okay keep reading getting your degree or getting your qualification is the start of it every day is a school day okay i say this to myself every day follow disruptors if you if you're collecting them and your podcast brilliant do that 
people like Mitch Kalowski, people, people like Richard Suskin, who wrote a book called Tomorrow, Tomorrow's Lawyers, nice. very interesting book. Embrace technology. You, 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 you long, young lawyers will be so much better at technology than the old has-beens like me, okay? So embrace technology. Question everything. Question everything, okay? Just because we've done it this way doesn't mean that's how you should always do it, okay? Be an iconoclast. Be prepared to actually say, do you know what? I want to try and change the business model because that's where, again, you'll get a competitive advantage. Awesome. So I'll just reiterate for every listener, read every day is a school day, which I got to learn from Sean that I'll use this phrase everywhere that every day is a school day. So read, follow disruptors, embrace technology, be curious, question everything and be an iconoclast. Thank you so much, Sean, for your time and for a session which is full of learning. I'm sure everything, everybody will enjoy this and learn a lot. Thank you very much for having me. I really enjoyed it. Thanks for your time. Hey there. Thank you for attending today's session. If you enjoyed today's session, do follow our channel and consider sharing it with a friend. My name is Prigya Arora, daughter of inspiring parents, alumna of IIT Kharagpur, engineer turned lawyer and entrepreneur, and now founder of PA Legal, where we help creators and innovators protect their intellectual property. Thank you.